Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios, coming to you from the home territory of the ghosts of Harper's Ferry. I'm Phil Bernberg. Today we're going to be discussing, today's topic is pottery mysteries, thixotropy, quartz inversions, and other pottery mysteries. And by that I mean these are topics and, and subjects that are not well understood or not well defined. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. So we're, we're continuing with our discussion of thixotropy, quartz inversions, and other pottery mysteries. And we just finished up in the last episode, we were talking about deflocculation. And as I mentioned before, we're, talk, we're trying to talk about these different terms in the general sequence in which the, the steps would occur in the pottery processing. So we're, we're talking about clay as it refers right now, for instance, to glazes and that sort of thing. So the next, the next subject or topic I wanted to talk about is actually one of our headline topics here, and that is thixotropy. So I'm not going to write it again. There it is, thixotropy. That's what we're talking about. Thixotropy basically is a property of liquids. And what it means is that as you stir or you move the liquid, it seems to get easier to stir the liquid or easier to move it. So it's as if the liquid is getting thinner or runnier as you stir it. And this effect is generally caused by the presence of either platelets, platy shaped things like our clay particles, or in some cases, fibers can also do it. And when the, when the structure of the clay, for example, assumes, we talked about flocculation last episode, assumes something like this, there's a little bit of force holding these clay particles together, or they could be fibers also that are slightly entangled. So when I go, if this is suspended in the water, when I go to stir it, when I first stir it, I have to sort of break up this structure, so there's a little resistance to it. So as I stir it, I gradually break, I tear these apart, and I gradually break them apart, and so the liquid gets easier and easier to stir as these, as these separate, and they start to move as individual particles rather than as clumps. So that's basically what you're seeing. And this, this flocculation is a fairly common, thix, uh, flocculation is present in a lot of glazes, so the thixotropy is a fairly common property of a lot of glazes, especially those with high clay. The glaze will have sat for a while, and you stick the stirring rod into it or the spoon, and you go to stir it, and it looks almost like custard. And the more you stir it, it gets runnier and runnier, and finally starts to look like a liquid. And, that, and so that, pro that, that property of behavior like that is called thixotropy. Something related to it, but it's kind of the opposite, is dilatancy. which you don't hear the term a lot, but we actually run into it a lot. This is kind of the opposite effect, that if you have a liquid or a suspension and you stir it, the more you try to stir it, the harder it becomes to, it becomes to stir. And you can actually, there's an example I'll tell you about in a minute, where it can actually get it so, you can take a liquid and it becomes so hard to stir that you can tear the liquid. The liquid actually tears. And a good example of this, that probably every, of, six, of dilatancy, that probably everyone has seen is at the beach, at the shoreline, like if this is the shoreline and here's the water, right here where the water is sort of lapping up on the shore but it's not really sitting there, but with sort of wet sand, the sand right there is dilatant. And the way you can tell is, and you may have noticed this already, is if you stand on that sand and you stomp your foot on it really fast, it'll be like concrete. You don't sink in, you can just stand there. But if you stand there and you wiggle your toes slowly, you kind of sink down into the sand. And so one of the characteristics of that latency is the faster you try and the harder you try to move it, the more it resists. And if you move slowly, then you can get you can you can move you can move the particles and you can get it to flow a little bit. So um, and and so if I this, so that one thing you may have noticed also is uh, people that that jog or run a lot if they run on the beach. This is where they run if they know what they're doing. Because you don't want to run in the water because that's, that's tiring, and also because the sand, is your feet are sinking into it, so you're wasting energy. And you don't want to run on the dry sand because you're sinking in and you're wasting energy. Whereas if you run right here, when your foot slaps down on the sand, because it's dilatant, it doesn't sink in, and it gives you firm support. 
So you get the least, you waste the least amount of energy running on the dilatant part of the sand, although they probably don't know the term, but that's where you'll see them running. Um, there's also another good example is an, you can, you can, this is really fun. If you want to make some of this at home, get, buy a small container of cornstarch and you mix it with water two to one, two to two parts cornstarch. This can be by just measuring cup, two parts cornstarch to one part water. And you mix it up and you make something which is called oobleck. And I think somebody gave that name. I think it's, it's actually adopted from a Dr. Seuss book. But what is it? You'll make a, a you'll make a, a dilatant mixture of the starch and the water. And it's it if if you if you make it, it looks sort of like a liquid. And if you pour it very slowly, it will pour. And if you try to stir it very slowly, it will stir. But if you stick a spoon or something into it and you pull it, you can actually rip and tear the liquid. And then when you pull the spoon out, it'll flow back together and heal the the rip. And I've seen, there was a great demonstration that I've seen done occasionally by students, by pottery students at some of these conventions and meetings, and it's kind of fun. And you make a big flat tray of oobleck with maybe about an inch thick of this stuff, and you can run across it, but if you stand on it, you sink into it. Um, and the, the, the cause for this, the reason why this behavior happens is because if I have a whole lot of similarly shaped particles, they can be, in this case, the, the shape doesn't matter too much. And with just a little bit of water between them, when I, just the minimum amount of water between the particles, when I try to move them and change the orientation of the particles, the water can't move and rearrange, move that quickly. So it actually sort of creates suction between the particles. So the only way I can move it is to move it slowly enough so that when the one particle moves over, the water can kind of reposition itself because they're not flowing in the water. There's just enough water to glue them together. So it actually creates, again, like a suction force if you try to move them too fast. And some pottery, some good examples that we see in pottery beside with oobleck or at the beach are the sludge at the bottom of glazes that we talked about when the glaze settles out. In a lot of cases, the reason why it's so nasty is because it's dilatant. And you, and you may have noticed this, that when you try to stir that sludge up in the bottom of the glaze bucket, the harder and the faster you try to stir it, the more it seems to resist. And the only way to do it is to slowly work the stick down into it and then slowly move it and try to get it moving. Once you get it moving and you, and you get more water between the particles, then you can stir it and move it. But in a lot of cases, it's dilatant, especially with frits, because frits basically have all the same size particles. If, if you had different shapes and different sizes, they wouldn't pack together necessarily so well, so tightly, so you wouldn't create this condition. But if they're all the same, then they pack together really well with this minimum amount of water. And, and so glazes that have, especially cone six glazes that have a lot of frit are notorious for creating this concrete-like sediment at the bottom of the bucket. The other thing that we, we may run into that uh, if you work with porcelain, porcelain, wet porcelain clay it actually is dilatant because the porcelain clay is made of a very narrow range of particle sizes of the clays that are in it, and so I create this condition again. When I have a certain amount of water in the porcelain, the porcelain is actually dilatant. So when I try to move it quickly, it actually resists me, so I have to sort of coax it and move it slowly. But you can get it to the point where it sort of feels soft and gooey, and it almost slumps if it gets too wet, but if you try to move it quickly again, it sort of freezes and locks up. So some of those weird behaviors of porcelain is actually due to the fact that it's, it's, it's dilatant. All right, so the next, the next topic I want to talk about, we're, we're moving now on sort of in the processing sequence. I want to talk, the term is venturi. This is a term that's really misused a lot. It has a nice scientific sound to it, so I found people tend to throw it around a lot, especially when they want to impress people, and they usually use it incorrectly. Although we do use it, we do, you know, there are, there's a proper usage. Venturi. The venturi, with respect to pottery, really refers to a feature generally of gas burner design or kiln design. But the, un, the underlying principle is this, is that when I, have a, when I have a liquid or a gas moving through a tube or a pipe, Here's a tube or a pipe and it has a constriction in it, and I've got a liquid or a gas moving through it. If it's flowing through, when it moves through here, it has to speed up to get through because I've got this much stuff 
that has to get through a smaller space. So it actually has to go faster when it's going through there. Well, when it goes faster through that little constriction, the pressure actually drops down. There's actually a, a less pressure in the fluid here than there is there. That's basically, this, and this, this, this basic principle of this, this thing that happens is called Bernoulli's principle. Did I spell that right? Yeah, Bernoulli's principle. Um, and it has a lot of practical applications. It's used in, in so if this has less pressure, it, essentially you can say it creates a vacuum or it creates suction. Well, we use this, for instance, in gas burners. Is, here's, a, here's an example. This is what's called a Venturi burner. So the gas is coming in here, and here's the constriction. It's, it starts off wide, and then it constricts, and then it gets wider again. So what happens right here is when the gas is slowing this constriction, it speeds up. And when it speeds up, the pressure drops. So we, can, we use that in this kind of a burner because the pressure drops it, to draw in air. Essentially, it creates suction right here. It's flowing down this way, but it creates suction. So we, have, we, cre we use an opening here. In this case, it has an adjustable size to actually draw in air. So a Venturi burner takes advantage of this Venturi effect to draw in air to mix with the gas. And this is what's called, when you're talking about kiln term terminology, this is what's called primary air because the air is being mixed directly with the fuel. So this is a good example. This, so this is a Venturi burner. And it takes advantage of this principle. Um, there are also Venturis that were used before cars, all cars and trucks and vehicles now had fuel injection. They had carburetors. Well, a carburetor used a Venturi because if you looked at a carburetor, basically it looked something like this. There was a, there was a, and this is, this is sitting on the top of the engine, and it's pull, the engine is pulling in air. Well, when the air is pulled in through this throat of the carburetor, right here at, the, at this constriction, it creates a suction. Well, that's where it drew in the gasoline. So the gasoline came into the carburetor where, to, with this suction, and then it was mixed with the air and went down into the engine. So the carburetor used, again, when you, when you looked at the top and you saw this horn on some of the carburetors, that's the end of the Venturi that you're looking at. And the same principle is actually also used for airfoils, this idea of velocity and pressure. This is why airplanes stay up in the air and birds stay up in the air. Because if you create an airfoil shape, exaggerated like that, when the air moves over it, the air, there's a longer path on the top than on the bottom because it's curved. So there's less pressure. The pressure is reduced slightly on the top compared to the bottom. So the pressure pushes up and supports the airplane or the bird. So the term sounds scientific, but it's misused, it's misused a lot. I've especially seen it misused a lot with respect to kiln design. People will say, well, this kiln was designed or built to have a venturi in the chimney or to have a venturi in the exit flue. And when I've, when I've looked at them, usually either it wasn't a venturi at all, or if it was, there was no advantage to having it. So it's just a term that, again, people for some reason tend to throw it around a lot. Um, the main application that we, we use it in pottery would be for burners. Okay, reduction is another term I want to talk about since we're talking about firing and things related to firing. This is just, I just want to de define it a little, maybe a little better. This occurs in fuel-fired kilns where something is burned, and it refers to the balance between the fuel and the air. Basically what it means is when you're firing in reduction or you're creating reduction, there's not enough air to completely burn all the fuel. So if I had something like propane, which I believe, I believe the form, whoops, I believe the formula, it doesn't really matter, but I believe the formula for propane is that. Even if it isn't, we'll use it. When you burn this with, with oxygen, typically what I'd produce would be carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and I'd make water. Those would be the products of burning it completely. If I don't have enough air to completely burn it, I'll still get water, but instead of getting carbon dioxide, I get carbon monoxide. And we hear a lot about this. This is something that they always warn you to be careful about if you have a furnace or a heater, because this is, this is deadly. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and it might, if I, if I even have really heavy reduction, instead of getting carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, I might actually just make soot, just carbon soot. You see carbon soot, for instance, this is what comes off a candle. 
when you if you hold something like a piece of metal over on, or glass or something over, that won't burn over the top of a candle, that black that's that's basically unburned carbon, that's soot. So when you're firing reduction, what we actually want to make is we want to make carbon monoxide. That's the that, this is chemically active, and this is what is going to re, is going to react with the the colorings, especially like things like iron and copper in the clay and in the glazes, and bring about the color changes that we want. Soot, if we if we over reduce, we make soot. Soot doesn't do anything as far as reduction and making. It's just a product, but it means we've 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 made too much reduction. We want to make carbon monoxide. So. What this means is that when you're firing in reduction, you have to control the, 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 the mixture between the gas and the air. You don't want to get complete burning because then you're not getting reduction, but you also don't want to make a lot of soot because you're not, this is what you want to make. So to get good reduction, you actually, you, the point is you have to control the balance between the air and the fuel. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Please. Okay, let's talk, now I wanna talk about, again, one of, our, one of our headline topics here, quartz inversions. Or we'll talk about the more general term, silica inversions. Silica, which is this, which is silicon dioxide, silica. Silica exists in a, in a number of different crystalline forms. It's all this, but there are slightly different ways that you can, uh, you can attach or group together the silicon and the oxygen atoms. Maybe the different angles are slightly different arrangements. Um, and the most common ones that we run into would be quartz, Quartz is a form, one, one form of silica. There's another one, I'm going to list it here because it's fairly common, but we don't see it. It's called tritomite. And there's another one called cristobalite, which we do see. Cristobalite. These are all forms of silica. They're all just that, but with slightly different arrangements of the atoms. And these, by the way, these are all mineral names. Because all of these different forms that we're talking about actually occur in nature. Quartz is by far the most common. I mean, this is, this is a piece of quartz that I found taking a walk in the woods nearby here. And then recently, and this is just called milky quartz because it, it, it happens to be white, but it's quartz. And then this is another example of a piece I just found recently when I was sort of prospecting along our local highway. And in this case, it's not quite as white, but also, I don't know whether you can see it, it started to form a crystal because there were pockets in the in the, in, the, in the rock, and so it actually started to form a quartz crystal. But this is really common, and it's present in all of our clays and in all of our glazes. This is the basis, as we talked earlier, this is the basis basically for pottery of our clays and our glazes. Um, so the, anyway, so now with these, there, in addition to these separate forms, each one of these forms also has what's called a high temperature and a low temperature form. Remember the, the, the mantra for pottery is nothing is ever simple, okay? So each one of these has a high temperature, or I'll, I'll do it in the, in the other. It has a low temperature form, and low is relative. So it has a low temperature form, and it has a high temperature form, okay? So there's, there's low quartz and high quartz, and they, give, they usually give these things because they have not much imagination. They give them Greek letters. So the low is generally called alpha, and the high form is generally called beta, for lack of imagination. So there's low and high quartz, there's low and high tritomite. We can skip that one for now. And there's low and high cristobalite. And the point is that when you, if you, if you were to take quartz and heat it up, and normally the quartz that you, all the quartz I'd find, for instance, in the ground like this, this would all be low quartz. Low, again, this is relative. Um, but if I were to heat it up to high temperatures, like the kind of temperatures we get, we do in a glaze firing, it would actually change to the high temperature form, okay? This hap the change happens around 1,000 degrees. And then when I cooled it back down, it would, it would 
change, when it got to 1,000 degrees again, it would change back to the low form. So when you were done, you wouldn't maybe necessarily see any, you know, there wouldn't be anything obvious difference to look at. But all of them do that. The chrysobolite, the tritobite, when you heat it up, the, the low, at, at some temperature, particular temperature, it changes from low to high, and then when it cools back down, it goes back down to the high to the low. Well, the other point is that, that, oh, well, first of all, these changes are the inversions. That's what the, that's what the term inversion means. It means the change of, from the low to the high or the high to the low. The direction doesn't matter. But that change is an inversion. And the point is that when they change, they also change in, in volume a little bit. So, and they generally, when you heat them up, they generally expand a little bit. And when you cool them back down, they contract a little bit. So if I were to heat up quartz, and I start off with the low form, around 1,000 degrees, it's going to change to the high form, and it's going to expand a little bit. And then I, I keep on heating. And then I cool it back down, and when it changes, now when I get to 1,000 again, the high changes to low, and it contracts a little bit. So a typical sequence that might happen when I fire, when I fire, let's say, a clay body, and the clay, all of the clay bodies contain a lot of silica. So there's silica in, actually in the clay itself, and then we add silica as an ingredient. So during the firing, when I heat it up to 1,000, um, on the way up, at, when I get to 1,000, the low quartz changes to the high quartz, and it, the coarse particles expand a little bit. Now, when I get to higher temperatures, some of the quartz can actually change into cristobalite. Okay? There is no cristobalite in naturally occurring clays. It's a very rare mineral by itself. But, but they, these forms can change into one another. So as I'm heating up the quartz, after it goes to the high quartz, now some of it, the quartz, so several things can happen to the quartz. Some of the quartz can just stay in the high form. Some of it can actually change in the cristobalite. And some of it, of course, could actually melt and become part of the glass. OK? So now, when, I, when the clay cools, so now I heat it up. Now when the clay cools down, the quartz that has stayed as quartz will now change the other way. When it gets to around 1,000, the, the, the high quartz will change to low quartz, and the low quartz grains will contract a little bit. But now I have made some cristobalite at high temperature, right? So when I get to a lower temperature, around 500 degrees in round numbers, Fahrenheit, the cristobalite changes from the high form to the low form, and it contracts a little bit. And in this, because of the slight differences in the structure, when the cristobalite contracts, it contracts more than the quartz does, just as a side point. And that's the... So, Coming back down, I've gone through the quartz. I, I went through the quartz inversion on the way up, and now coming back down, I went through the quartz inversion, and then I went through the cristobalite inversion. All together, these are called the silica inversions. Okay, the problem associated with this is that if I have a lot, especially with cristobalite, especially if I if I have a lot of cristobalite in the clay, I, if I've made a lot of cristobalite, when I get down to around 500 degrees. If there's a lot of it, there's a lot of contraction going on all at once, and that can result in cracking. And the main term, the thing that we see that that related to is called dunting. And this is where, basically, there's so much cracking of the pot that very often the pot is just completely destroyed. It just falls into random pieces. And this is caused by the sudden contraction of the cristobalite on the way down. Generally, the crystal, from what I've seen at least, the cristobalite is more the cause than the quartz because it actually contracts more when it, when it goes through the, ch the change. The other thing is, I, in, at least in my opinion, I've never seen rapid heating of bisqueware sometimes, uh, causing a problem. You'll, you'll hear about precautions. People will say, don't heat up the kiln too fast because when the quartz expands, when you reach the quartz inversion, it'll crack the pot. I've never seen that to be a problem because if you think about it, bisqueware is porous. So if, if I'm heating it up and I get to the quartz inversion, and let's say there's a little quartz grain and it changes to the high form and it wants to expand, it can. It can just go crunch and it can crunch into the space. There's space around it, so it has room to expand. So I've never seen that to be a problem. Um, but, cool, but now if you're, if you're, re, if you're refiring work that has gotten completely dense, that's a whole different situation because now if there's quartz in it, and, and a lot of little quartz particles, and they want to expand, there's no room for them to expand. So in that case, I can believe that, yes, it could crack the pot. So I, I don't know whether this, this idea that heating it up too quickly can, um, can cause cracking because of the quartz inversion. I'm just guessing that maybe that originated from the fact that 
people were refiring pots in the same firing that they were firing, you know, bisqueware. I don't know, but I've just never seen that effect. I've done some really rapid firing with wood firing and some other firing. It's gotten a really high temperature fast. I've never seen that as, as a problem. I have seen problems where you get cracking during rapid heating because of unequal heating. If you're heating one part of a pot a lot faster than another and it expands due to the heating, I've seen cracking, but nothing that I could really attribute to the crystallite. Okay, another term that relates to heating is, um, is heat work. We're doing okay, Dennis, I guess I'm, okay, we'll just keep going, we'll just keep going, okay. Heat work. Heat work. Heat work, you can, one way to think about it is the total heat or the total energy that's absorbed by something. So and it, it's really, it's a combination of temperature and time. Pyrometric cones measure or respond to heat work the same as the pots do. That's why they're really useful. And the reason for that is because in order to, when we when we talked previously about the changes that occur in a glaze or the changes that occur in the clay when you heat it up, it takes time for those changes to occur. They can't happen instantaneously. It's sort of analogous to, you know, you can say, well, I'll put a pot roast in the oven at 350 for two hours. Why don't I put it in the hour at a, in the pot in the oven for a thousand for, for 10 minutes? Because the pot roast will be burned on the outside and not cooked on the inside. Well, in an analogous way, there are things that have to happen inside the clay and inside the glaze, and they take time. Heat is not enough. So the point is that it's, it's actually it's much better when you're monitoring or you're controlling a firing to use cones and not just temperature. Temperature is just an instantaneous measurement of the heat right then and there, but it doesn't give you any, any indication of the accumulated effect of the heat. And that's what the clay and the glazes respond to, the accumulated effect of the heat, and that's the heat work. Okay, next, next term to talk about is this is the basis of all of our glazes is eutectic. That's supposed to be a U, eutectic. A eutectic, the term refers to the effect where you take two materials and when you come, or two or more materials, and when you combine them together, they melt at a lower temperature than any of them would by itself. It's kind of a bizarre effect. But this is the basis for most of our glazes. We mentioned, for example, and this ties into the use of a flux, where silica by itself melts at over 3,000 degrees, and I add a flux to it, and when I add the flux to it, now together they melt at a lower temperature. Well, I, when I do that, I can say that I have created or formed a eutectic. So the flux and the silica together form a eutectic. That is, together they melt at a lower temperature than either the flux or the silica would melt by itself. And there's a really common example that, that probably everybody, at least that lives in a northern part of the world, has experienced. And that is, you throw salt on, on the ice on your driveway and you walk in the winter to melt the ice. What you're doing is you're forming a eutectic between the salt and the ice. And salt melts at a really high temperature, a couple of, I don't know, 1,700, 1,800 degrees, way up there. And ice, we know, melts at 32. But when I put the salt on the ice, together they form a eutectic, and now the ice melts at around, I think it's 27 or 28 degrees. So if it's, 30, if it's freezing out, 32 degrees, and you have ice, and you put the salt on it, the salt forms the eutectic, that makes it melt at 27, so now the ice is liquid, and you'd have to go below 27 or 28 degrees, whatever the exact temperature is, for it to freeze again. So you've actually made, formed the eutectic between the salt and the solid ice. Okay, and there's, and so you talk about the eutectic temperature, that's this, the temperature at which this lower melting occurs, or the eutectic composition. That means that there might be certain proportions of two materials, and this, this is true for the ice and the, and the water. There are actually certain proportions where this eutectic happens and you get the lowest temperature, and that's called the eutectic composition. So, but it all refers to this formation of this, this lower melting temperature. And the last, the last item I want to talk about, or the last definition, is the coefficient of thermal expansion. And it's abbreviated either CTE, which is coefficient of thermal expansion. For people that work with glass, 
they tend to abbreviate it more like this, COE, coefficient of expansion, but it's the same thing. And actually, it's important to remember that it's not just the coefficient of thermal expansion, it's the coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction. And what this means, what this refers to is the fact that just about every material that there is, when you heat it up, and you're probably familiar with this already, when you heat it up, it expands, and when you cool it down, it contracts. And so generally, when you heat it up and it expands a certain amount, and then you cool it back down to the starting point, it contracts back to where it started. There isn't any sort of leftover something. So, and the, the coefficient, it's, it's called a coefficient because it's just a number. It's a number that describes for every degree of temperature change, how much does it expand or how much does it contract? And there's a very, you, you, and this is something you, you use this a lot in your everyday life. If you have a jar of spaghetti sauce and you can't get the lid off, you hold it under, you hold the lid under the hot water. Well, the steel cap has a higher coefficient of thermal expansion than the glass. So when you hold it under the hot water, the steel cap expands more than the glass does and it becomes loose and you can open the jar of spaghetti sauce. And the differences in the coefficient of thermal expansion actually result in two fairly common glaze defects, crazing and sintering. Crazing occurs, crazing if you remember is where you have this network of fine cracks in the glaze. Crazing occurs when the coefficient of expansion of the glaze is a lot higher than the coefficient of expansion of the clay. So that, what that means is when, when you heat up the glaze and you fire the pot, and now you're cooling it back down and the glaze solidifies. So I have a layer of solid hot glass sitting on hot clay. And they're both trying to shrink as they're cooling down, but they're shrinking at different rates because the clay and the glaze have different coefficients of expansion. Well, if the glaze tries to shrink a lot more than the clay, it basically all it can do is crack, and that's the crazing. So it's because the, the crazing is caused when the glaze wants to shrink more than the clay. If the opposite situation occurs, if I'm cooling it back down and the clay wants to shrink a lot more than the glaze, the clay is trying to shrink underneath the glaze, and the glaze doesn't want to shrink. And, the, and if, it, if that condition is severe enough, what happens is the clay shrinks. You can't stop it from shrinking, but it actually pops the glaze off the, off the clay, and that's called shivering. The ideal situation for glazes is actually to have the, to have the the clay have a slightly higher coefficient of thermal expansion. I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, the, the, have the, the clay have a slightly higher coefficient of expansion than the glaze. So when the glaze and the clay are cooling down, the clay actually squeezes the glaze a little bit. The clay wants to contract slightly more than the glaze, and it squeezes the glaze, puts the glaze in compression. He talks about forces, compresses the glaze, and it actually strengthens the glaze by doing that, and it actually strengthens the whole pot by doing that, by having the glaze slightly in compression. There are different chemical elements with glaze. We don't, we don't talk so much about the coefficient of expansion of a clay body because it's not something that you can determine readily. You have to measure it. But you can look at a glaze recipe and you can estimate what the coefficient of the glaze is. And there are certain different elements in the glaze contribute to the coefficient of expansion. For instance, sodium in particular, and also potassium, tend to create a high coefficient of expansion. So if you see a glaze that has a lot of sodium ingredients in it, you can almost guarantee with just looking at the recipe that it's going to craze. If it has a lot of nepheline cyanide or a lot of, of a lot of a high sodium flux, there's a good chance it's going to craze. Lithium, on the other hand, for example, has a very low coefficient of expansion, as does silicon itself, just the silica. So if I have a glaze that just has a lot of silica in it or fluxes such as lithium, that has a low coefficient of expansion. So that's, that's going to be less likely to craze. So the point is that it's the balance between all the different chemical elements in a glaze that creates the coefficient, that results in the coefficient of expansion that we see. Well, that's all we had, that's all we had for this episode of this topic. We finished all the, the current things that I wanted to talk about. So again, I hope this discussion, we're wrapping up this discussion on this topic. I hope the discussion has been useful. And again, if it was you know, too much information at one time to digest easily, um, you can listen to our podcast version. Just go to your favorite podcast platform and look for the Potter's Roundtable. Um, if you enjoyed the presentation, please like it, um, share it with your friends, and that'll help our videos get found. If you didn't like it, tell us why. We'd like, you know, maybe we can do better next time. 
Um, also, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. We have five options, five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. And we decided instead of naming them the typical gold, silver, bronze, platinum, we decided to give them clay names. So the first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a bisque level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever you like, or on your forehead. Um, looks like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. And again, you get all the previous benefits. You also get a handmade by, our, by Dennis, our, our, one of our founding members here, a handmade uh, pot, Potter's Roundtable mug. So we'd appreciate any kind of support you can provide. The next topic in this whole series of talks is going to be Chapter 22, Pottery and Physics. Thank you again for visiting with us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.